So we've been covering a lot of theory, and I want to give you a couple of models for drawing it all together. Again, um, it will take a while to sim assimilate and integrate all of this information. And um, I'm going to suggest some reading later uh, to help you in that process. Um, but the first model I want to share with you is a model from Bill Holloway, who was a former president of ITAA. He pointed out, at birth, the basic position all of us are born into in reality is I have worth, value, and dignity. You have worth, value, and dignity. I'm OK. You're OK. Then as we begin to interact with parents, and they encounter behaviors in us that trigger things in them that they feel threatened about, they give out injunctions. And on the basis of those injunctions, we make a decision or decisions about I and or you not being OK in some way. And that leads us to feel bad, which often becomes our bad feeling racket. And part of the fantasy is, if I just feel bad enough long enough, you will forgive me and you will change, and I'll magically move back up into being OK again. Uh, for example, if the injunction was don't be or don't exist, I might feel guilty about my existence. That's my, re my racket. And it, I feel like if I just feel guilty enough long enough, you will, feel, you will forgive me for being born. Well, in order to keep feeling that way, I have to play ga a game uh, to justify that bad feeling. And the fantasy often is, uh, if I just recreate that situation over and over again, maybe one of these times, you'll tell me it's okay to be here. And again, I will magically move up into being okay. And each time I play a game, I can collect what are called psychological trading stamps. Byrne was developing this theory back when people were saving SNH green stamps, gold bond stamps. You know, you save up all these books and you cash them in for a prize. And he said, people do that with feelings. Yeah. Something happens, I don't say anything, I just paste a book in my stamp. After I get uh, 100 books, then I feel justified in hauling off and knocking you cold or whatever. Or in this case, with a don't be injunction, um, if I just save enough stamps, I feel justified in the script payoff, which is ultimately my fantasy is if I just kill myself, then I'll be able to lift up the lid on the coffin, look out, see how much mom and dad love me at last. Once I've paid the ultimate price of not being here, after all, it felt like that's what they wanted. And I'll magically again be OK. Now the script begins with the child's decision. And the only way out of the script, in reality, is through a process called a redecision, changing that early decision deciding um, that I really didn't produce the sperm or the egg. I don't have any responsibility for my being here. That was all the parents doing. And I've been conned. And I have every right to be here. Um, and uh, I have worth and value whether they ever are in a position of affirming it or not. So I reclaim my okayness and my power and my autonomy in order to give up that script. Marty Groder had a program called the Asclepian Project, one of the few programs that was ever successful in rehabilitating prisoners. And he moved to North Carolina because he was going to be appointed uh, warden at a federal penitentiary in Nor here in North Carolina. He talked about the difference between hope versus courage. And uh, he said, the script leads us to hope for perfection. You know, after all, the fairy tales all teach us if you just do everything right, you end up living happily ever after, right? Uh, so that, you know, it's really hard to let that go when you have the promise of getting it all, 100%. And he said there are active forms of, of hope. 
uh, and passive forms. Some of the active forms are frantically searching for the right man who's going to fulfill all my dreams, or the right woman, or the right therapist, or guru who's going to give me all the answers, and so forth. Uh, another active form of hope, of hope is pretending. You know, there's a book called Fake It Till You Make It. If I just pretend like everything is perfect long enough, maybe one of these days it will turn out to be. A third active form of hope is what he called monomania, looking for the answer, the truth. You know, a lot of, some people made a lot of money a few years ago on the secret. Um, you know, as though there's one answer that's just going to solve all your problems and make your life perfect. And then he pointed out there are passive forms of hope, like waiting. Maybe if I just wait long enough, she'll love me. Byrne used to talk about um, a game called Waiting for Santa Claus, only to find out in the, in the end that it's rigor mortis that shows up. Um, another passive way of, uh, of hope, or another passive form of hope, is giving up. Um, this is one of my favorites. It's like, you know, when you're waiting for a bus, the moment you give up and walk away, it's going to be there, right? <laughs> so people will do things like this. I give up. trying to make that magic work. And he points out that uh, the solution really is to have the courage to live in an imperfect world where there is no 100%. That's the bad news. The good news is you can get about 98%, which is pretty darn good. And the alternative to searching is exploring, discovering what will work. The alternative to pretending is being real. Uh, that's the only way you can really get your needs met, is by being honest and open and vulnerable and real with people. The alternative to monomania is developing a sense of enthusiasm and commitment to what is possible. Even though it's not 100%, it can be pretty exciting. You at 98%. The alternative to waiting is having patience. Because some people and situations are going to take time uh, to change. They're not going to do it in instantaneously. And it requires having some patience to hang in there uh, and to work it through. The alternative to giving up is letting go. There are some people in situations who are simply not going to change no matter what you do. And what you have to do is let go and move on with your life, which often involves a grieving process. Now, that has been a very helpful frame of reference for me in terms of uh, looking at change. To have the courage to explore, be real, develop a sense of enthusiasm and commitment for what is possible, to be patient in that process, and to let go of what is not possible. Any questions or comments Sir, about that? Hi, what did you say the, who is the man? Uh, uh, Martin Groder, G-R-O-D-E-R. He was a psychiatrist who was a teaching member in ITAA. Okay. Where does uh, your personality adaptation questionnaire fall into this framework? Well, different personality styles will attempt to do all of this in different ways. And uh, again, the advantage of knowing about that, I think I was talking about uh, yesterday, is to know how to make contact with the person to really establish rapport, where to target your interventions in a way that's going to have the greatest potential for change, and what area to avoid in order not to get stuck in the client's defenses. I mean, you, we've been talking about this in the context of individual change, and I'm interested how this could be applied like to social justice, you know, mm -hmm. to social justice efforts, because I think there's some correlation, and I'd be interested to hear from anyone about how you think about that. 
Well, I think about this applying in institutions and organizations uh, in a very similar way, that uh, sometimes people are attempting to do things that are really not possible because of who they're dealing with in the situation. Um, but what's important is exploring what is possible and doing that and realizing you're not going to get it all perfect, but you can get about 98% often. Yeah. You, you know, it makes one? me think about uh, uh, one of the clients that we're working with now. And, and Joe, I'm thinking about a client we're sharing. And in, in terms of the, we, we've had to have the courage to be patient with the process of change that they're creating. Hideko, you know about this group. And sometimes we have to let go. So that came up for me as you were talking. And we are working with some folks at the institutional level who get it, you know, who understand the notion of power sharing and the need for systemic and cultural change in, in a big way. And they are managing up, they call it, to the leadership who are getting it, but we've been at this for about a year and a half, and I would say we are probably 50% of the way with leadership, and we see movement. So we are, we've been exploring, we've been being real, and the, the people, the internal uh, clients ha are, have developed the kind of relationship in which they can now speak their truth. That was the first step, to be real with the people who have power over you and who can kill this initiative if they want to, yeah. right? Yeah. And then they, those folks, are, she have so much enthusiasm, right, about the, the way, the small changes, and because they're there every day, they can see the difference. So we've been trying to roll out a big initiative that may go organization-wide. When we first started two years ago, the, the, there was so much fear about talking about difference, race in particular, and gender, but race in particular, that if you said white folks and black folks, or white folks and people of color, many white folks would say, Say, naming race is racist, right? So that's where we started. And, and now we're at the point of having race dialogues in different teams. The other thing this makes me think about is um, some elements of white supremacy culture, like perfection, and that's about 100% idea. Right. You know, like either it's all or we just failed and we're just gonna give up. And the 98% <laughs> and the, just the words exploring gives the idea that this is an ongoing process. And for me, one of the places as a consultant where I think I have to sometimes, you know, build this skill of courage is about trusting the process of, I think you've just mentioned this, but trusting the process of the, and the time that it's going to take mm -hmm. for a particular client to move and letting go of the outcome that I wish would happen right. sooner, right? right. Yeah, yeah. and still not fall into, oh well, give up. Yeah. Yeah. It, also, it also reminds me too that in our work, we've worked, been in this long enough, we, since, since 84, it, that what we see is that sometimes organizations go a certain point in the journey, yeah. and then they might have a change of leadership, a change of direction, and they go back. Mm -hmm. And then they come back. So it's, it, I don't think, I think having the faith and courage that, you're, that there's, a, there's a recycling is also a big important. When I was a um, college chaplain at uh, St. Andrews Presbyterian College in Laurenburg, North Carolina, um, I was directing what was called the St. Andrews Peace Corps, which actually predated the National Peace Corps. And um, one of the things we were doing is working with uh, minority kids in the school system. And one of the things we discovered was they were having trouble uh, uh, attending academically because they were hungry. They, most of them came to school without eating. And so I wrote a grant, uh, to the, uh, got a grant from the Presbyterian Church to start a breakfast program in Laurenburg. And uh, I had to be patient. And I hung in there, and I kept responding and answering their questions and so forth. And finally, I got the program through. But uh, it took a lot of patience um, on a in a lot of ways <laughs> for me to be able to get that through. So. When you were describing the overall goal of TA, um, and it was framed for the individual, 
And I and in hearing that Byrne did work with groups and organizations, I'm curious what he would say is the goal at a uh, corporate level, like a collective group organizational level. And I'm curious. That's um, that's part one, and then part two is about: Are there any other uh, visions for what the overall goal is at a, a cultural level as well? Uh, anybody know what Burns said about about the goal of working with organizations? Do you remember specifically? He said a lot. <clears throat> he said a lot in the early '50s, before the McCarthyism stopped him. Before right. he became very concerned, scared legitimately about the witch hunts that were going on and he, he up to then he'd been talking about pol uh, psychotherapy is, uh, is political the psychotherapy has to be involved in politics and and all of that and then after that he became somewhat uh, less involved we had to be yeah. uh, under the circumstances so uh, for that reason uh, transactional analysis gets kind of cut off from the institutional arrangements. I am curious about, so you offered some thinking from Byrne, and I'm wondering if anyone else would be willing to frame a, a goal what, at the organization or even cultural level. As I recall, uh, in working with organizations, he had the same goal of creating a culture in which there were very positive values in terms of people being seen as okay and related to is okay and uh, to have spontaneity and fun and enjoyment in the, uh, on the, uh, in the culture and also clear technologies and thinking uh, in terms of problem solving for the organization. And I can add to that uh, by saying that in Sex and Human Love and when he talks about reducing the infant mortality rate that the psychotherapy should address he, tell, he uses this as an example in that, in that section about the, um, the, the kids on the street who become uh, violent and they shed blood. So you see he was tying the, the therapy into the institutional problems. Do you, do you get that? That he's making this connection between the, the uh, criminal justice system, the police system, um, the, the local political situation. Uh, I mean, stretch your imagination just a little, and he's, he's making the psychotherapy, he's putting it in the context of what's happening in society. I just wanted to say that one, there are several ways of uh, becoming a transactional analyst. There's to be a therapist, psychotherapy, education, organization, and counseling. And in the organizational field, there's been a lot of books and articles, lots written about how TA is applied to organizations that you could. And I also would say that, that the goal of creating equity at the, each level is a goal that I have taken from my understanding of transactional analysis. So power sharing is an important part, and what and whatever, level someone is in an organization does not set them up to feel less than as a person. That, back to the, I'm a, the value and worth is separate from my institutional role. Those are elements of the goals that I think that TA teaches. The book that Ian Stewart and I have followed uh, the outline of the 101 course, so that's one resource for additional reading. Uh, we have certification training programs in TA at our institute. There are other institutes throughout the world that have training programs and people from those who are here attending the conference. Uh, so that's another resource in terms of uh, where to go from here. Graham? Uh, then uh, what I'm gonna say now is very controversial. It's my personal claim, but I'm gonna say it because I feel like if I don't, I shouldn't have come here. <laughs> And you opened the door, Van, with your story of, of St. Andrews and what you did that were actually precursors of two national programs, Feeding the Children and... Uh, um, St. Andrews uh, Peace Corps. And the Peace Corps. Um, and what I want to make is that psychotherapy, divorced from institutional arrangements, is prostitution. 
Psychotherapists have taken psychotherapy out of the institutional arrangements. And if we don't put it back there, it's irrelevant. It can't do anything about racism in society because if you sit there and talk to the client or the patient or whoever it is about his or her racism or the effects of racism, that's beautiful. You're working on the individual level. It's nonsense. You cure the individual. The individual goes back into society without any tools. And this is what I feel passionate about. So now let me tell you, this is very personal, but I have to say it, or else I have no business being here. Unless we can, and this is about me too, because I have the same issues that I'm addressing here. How frustrated I've been. Not only have I worked on racism in the United States, I worked on ethnic cleansing, I worked on on uh, what was going on un under communism in ex-Yugoslavia starting in 1978. I didn't give up when I left uh, uh, the United States. I got involved with what was going on in the communist system in Yugoslavia. That was great. But I want to emphasize the importance of not just sitting there with the patient or even with the group. I even proposed in Transactional Analysis after Eric Byrne uh, in my introduction, I suggested that the therapy group might take on projects. Now then I come back to what you were doing. You were working within the institution. Right. And you were bringing about institutional change while at the same time you were giving attention to the um, children that needed food, the children that needed learning help, that needed counseling and all that. And that's why I chose you to come to Southeast Institute and help us carry on the work to the next phase. I made a damn good decision. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and you did too. <laughs> and, and, and I want to, to challenge you to keep thinking institution, 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 keep thinking culture, and ask ourselves how we can bring our therapy into the institutions to bring about change within, but let's get it to that institutional level. How do we change this institution? I'm gonna talk about that tomorrow. Good. I was gonna say, Graham, yes, give him a hand. Uh, I, I was gonna say that um, the folks that are here from Visions, that's what we're, doing, that's what we're here for, right? Yeah. And I think that the message, at one of my talk on Friday is gonna talk about the importance of, for, all, for folks of privilege on any of these variables to, ch to notice how have I been a bystander on this issue. And the, it, there is an urgency fueled as much as anything by the environmental destruction that we're in, right. as they say, 10 years. That's not long. So I'm with you, at, we, we, we've been talking about how we say the same thing from a very different frame. And the point about the need for each of us to step up at all four levels is gonna be your message. And I think it's a really powerful message, an important message in predominantly white spaces and predominantly privileged spaces. And often having white people talk about that to other white people is really critical. Not to say that we, we as people of color and we from all of our other historically excluded places need to have these messages and thank you for being willing to keep talking about that. In, in, from, from, 60, from since I, 68 was when this, when free started? So from 68, yeah, 68 until now. How many, it's almost, how many years? Yeah, 55 years and so um, we're gonna wrap up uh, with a exercise that we do in our workshop that I'd encourage you to practice also, which is to invite you to share any appreciations that you have. We're gonna take five minutes. Any appreciations you have for this time we spent together for yourself and or for anything else, and any regrets that you wanna share to leave here. Our idea is that we don't have to keep building on having unfinished business because we can let it go, taking that, the, we can have the courage to say it and let it go as we uh, move on to the next activity. Thanks. I wanna just really appreciate all of you for the level of your expertise 
and for the amount of information that you shared. At the same time, I have a regret that it was so much and that we didn't get time to kind of process it a little bit more. And I also had some regret around some of the cultural misses that I experienced in the content. So I just wanted to share that. Mm -hmm. It does not in any way discount the level of incredible information that I felt like got shared mm -hmm. and, the, and the commitment that I experienced from all of you around the value of this, not only in terms of personal change, but as well as around institutional change. So thank you. Thank you. Just a short appreciation to all of you as a fantastic panel. Uh, such a, a, a range of diversity of viewpoints, and you're all very passionate, and um, you're willing to step up and say what you think. You know, it's just um, fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I just appreciate the, uh, um, the diversity. Um, uh, appreciate the experience and the wisdom. Um, but Dr. Barnes, I wanted to give you a special appreciation too. I, I believe that the work I do, the work that we do is sacred. And I just want to honor that you brought some profane to the sacred. And so I really appreciate that element that you brought that, uh, that I got to experience. I'd yeah. like to appreciate the real variety in this group today with cultures and ages and experience, oldies but goodies, young, youthful energy. I think it's a, a very special group that we've had here today. So I want to say ditto. I appreciate each of you. And in many ways, it feels like homecoming. <laughs> I started this journey with the Southeast Institute in the early 70s through a program at a historically black college with the Lilly Foundation. And um, my journey in this work, it, the Southeast Institute, Val, Van, uh, Graham Felipe is a large part of why I keep doing this work, so thank you and I honor you. Thank you for being a, such a powerful example of how people who have, have exerted and shown and exemplified how change can happen in a very individualistic oriented, you know, larger society. I have hope that we can keep growing that upward and outward and the world, not just us. I mean, on Spaceship Earth, which is the only one large enough to hold all of us, we got to either learn how to talk to each other, take care of systemic problems, and look at what's ahead and bring our power together. And you guys are doing it. Thank you for being you. Thank you. Um, I want to appreciate the people who came here who, for whom English is not their first language. Um, I really admire their courage. 